Yeah, please open up your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, Again, that's our passage today. As we open up God's Word today, um, this passage is a challenging one. This passage teaches us, and this passage is uh, so important for us to, to truly apply. I said this last week, and I'll say it again. Take this passage in, and it will reshape the way that we live. Take this passage in, and it will reshape our lives. As I studied this passage, I I came to see how this is true more and more, and how we, we so need this passage. There's 15 words used in this passage to describe love, and each one of these words is a verb. We can't see it as clearly in the English, but each word, each word used to describe love, love here is a verb, meaning an action, an action. In other words, true love, our, our title today, uh, true love is not about how we feel, is not about the words we say, it's about the way that we live. True love has to do with the way that we live with one another. Oh, brothers and sisters, friends, listen. If we take in this passage today of God's instructions to us, it will change us, it will shape us, it will change our hearts, it will change the way that we live with one another. Oh, we need this passage. This passage has a way of showing us our hearts and reshaping our hearts to become more like Jesus' heart. This is such an important passage. It is such a needed passage. So let me go ahead and read this passage for us one more time. Uh, Same as last week, but let me read it for us one more time, and uh, we'll, we'll start to unpack it a bit piece by piece. So again, our passage today is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 4. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. This is God's true and perfect word. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It's God's word. So as I, uh, again, was uh, preparing the sermon this week, I really struggled with how to preach this passage because there's 15 words here being used to describe love. Each word should be one sermon each. When we say love is patient, oh, patience, that should be one sermon. Oh, love is kindness, that should be one sermon. There's so much for us to learn about each one of these words and how it shows us what true love is. Oh, there's so much here. But I also knew this is way too, that would would take way too long. So today we're going to look at the first two pairings. We're going to look at the first part of verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. Those are two pairs of uh, words describing love. Patient and kind. Envy or boast. Those are two pairs, and we'll look at those, that, that part of this passage today. So let's, uh, let's go ahead, and we'll, we'll dive right in to, to, uh, to this passage about love. First, patience. It says here in verse 4, love is patient. Love is patient. What do you think of when you hear the word patient? Do you consider yourself a patient person? Have you been in a situation where your patience was tested? You were tested to lose your patience. You were like, no, I don't want to wait anymore. Patience. Well, here it says love is patient. We, we have seen, we've all been in situations where we've seen an impatient driver on the road, right? Honking the horn, tailing, cutting off. We've seen an impatient boss at work uh, pushing uh, 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 dealing with, uh, with, uh, with employee, employees in, in different ways, an impatient boss. We've seen an impatient customer who loses their patience after waiting for only five minutes. 
Uh, we, we know, we, we've seen patience. Uh, we, we know what impatience looks like. But here in this passage, I want us to think more deeply, biblically, about what this passage means when it says love is patient. And how do we use this in our life? Now, to understand patience, first, I want to tell us what love, what, what patience is not. Patience is not being passive. Patience is not about being passive. Passive, being passive is someone who fails to take action, who waits too long to act, who waits, who fails to take action because they are fearful. They are afraid of taking action. Or uh, patience is not about, uh, it's not passive and it's not laziness. It's not inactivity. It's not lack of motivation. When we talk about patience, it's not about someone who is passive and hesitant to take action. Patience, rather, is, this is what it is, it's being slow to anger. Patience is about being slow to anger or having self-control. A good way to think about it is this. I was reading one, uh, one, uh, one writer this week, and the way he described it was patience about having a very big heart. What do you mean having a very big heart? For example, many things may come at us, come at us in our lives to offend us, to inconvenience us, and though many things come into our lives that are not good to offend us, our heart is so big that even though so many things come, it does not build up to the point of provoking us to respond in anger. Very big heart. No matter how many bad things come to provoke us, it never builds up to the point that it exceeds our heart and provokes us to respond in anger because our heart is so big. We are not easily angered. We are not easily provoked. We have great self-control. When the Bible talks about love is patient, oh, that's a picture of patience. Let me give us some examples. Joel chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. And this is God, the God of true patience. It begins in verse 12. Yet even now, oh, all these things have come before God to provoke him. All these things come before God to offend him. Yet it says in verse 12, yet even now, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, what, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Though many things come before God to offend him, because God is so slow to anger, he is a God of great patience. He is not a God who is easily provoked to lash out in anger. James 1, 19, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, describe many things about being, being, uh, being patient and being slow to anger. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 14, verse 29. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Notice the contrast there. It says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. This is about wisdom. But whoever is hasty in temper is a man of folly. Notice here the need for self-control, the need for patience. Proverbs 16, 32, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. We tend to think that the, the ones who are mighty are the ones who are quick to take action. But here it says whoever is slow to anger is better than the, those who are mighty or the, the ones who the world determines as mighty or who looks mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Oh, how great must you be to be able to to take a city? Well, here, the one who's able to control his anger is the one who's greater than the one who can take a city. (coughs) Excuse me. All right, Proverbs 19, 11, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. 
here it says, uh, uh, well, when you are offended by someone, when someone brings an offense to you, oh, the ones, it causes you to be shamed. Oh, for you to regain your honor, you must re respond to that offense. No, here it says, God, a good sense makes one slow to anger. It is his glory. His glory, not shame, not a loss of honor, not a loss of face. It is his glory to overlook an offense. Though an offense comes, I overlook it. That is my glory because it shows I'm slow to anger. My heart is so big. It may come, but it doesn't exceed. It doesn't provoke. Here it says love is patient. And the picture here is one who is not easily angered or provoked to react in vengeance. Now, that's what the Bible means by patience. A very big heart. Oh, big heartedness. But let me ask us this. Why? What is it for? Is patience just good because patience is so good? Oh, we should be patient. We should be slow to anger. We should be self-controlled because patience itself is so good. No, the Bible also teaches us that patience is good because patience has a purpose. Patience is used for something. Patience is good because it has a purpose, it has an end. For example, when we talk about God being a God of patience, if patience itself is good, wouldn't it make sense that God is always patient and God's patience never ends? But we know that God's patience is only for a time, and it will end. God's patience will end because patience itself is not the point. Patience is, is, is exercised for a purpose. God is a God who, who gives patience, who extends patience for a time, and he stops it because it is for a time for a purpose. Okay? I get this from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is what is patient toward you. Why? Why is God patient? It says God is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach, what? Repentance. This is why God shows patience. Patience is not good just because patience is good. No, God shows patience for a goal, for a purpose, and it's, uh, God, God shows patience to those who he, he wants one day to repent, to reach repentance. We see this also in Romans 2, 4, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? The purpose of patience shown, extended for a time, is for repentance. It's so that the one receiving your patience will, might reach repentance. In other words, God extends patience. God extends patience so that all should have the, 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 the added opportunity, the space, the time to repent. God can easily lash out and respond immediately in anger and vengeance and wrath. God can easily do that, but God waits. God shows patience for a time so that those who have offended, have sinned against him, will have more time, will have the opportunity to one day hopefully reach repentance. In other words, this is about the God who loves Reconciliation, loves restora restoring a relationship, loves repentance more than he loves repayment. So how do we use this for ourselves? If that's what patience is, slow to anger, this is what it's for, so they can have more chance more time, an opportunity to repent, so this relationship can be restored, 
so that reconciliation can happen between these two people who are in conflict? How do we use this for our lives? Let me ask you, when have you been offended? Recently, maybe, there's been an offense that happened to you. Maybe someone harmed you. Maybe someone sinned against you. Maybe someone, maybe not an not a evil sin against you. Maybe it's just something, someone that inconvenienced you, someone that got in your way and slowed you down. How did you respond? How are you responding now? Maybe not physically, but maybe in your heart, how are you responding now? Well, here, this passage says God is a God who extends patience who does not respond immediately with vengeance and wrath and repayment. He extends patience because he's hoping, he's, he's, a, he's a desiring, not hoping, he's desiring, he's desiring that this added time of patience given will lead to restoration of relationship, reconciliation. That's why we show patience. We give patience. We extend patience. We show patience desiring that this relationship will be restored. So when it says love is patient, that's what the Bible is calling us to, be people of patience. But going on, I want to see the other side of patience, which is kindness. It says in verse 4, love is patient and kind. Now these are two sides, patient and kind. These are uh, uh, both are needed by, uh, by us. Now, I'll be, I'll be very uh, honest when it comes to the, the topic of kindness. Uh, I, before I studied this passage more deeply, I used to, uh, in my heart, laugh whenever I see the word kindness being used. Uh, for example, I'll see a poster where someone will say, just be kind. Who cares about the differences that are in the world? Who cares about the different... Uh, ways that we live and who cares about the different opinions that we have just be kind to everyone that's what really I, uh, I was walking down the street one time and I was walking next to this elementary school and I saw a huge painting on the wall of this elementary school in big colorful uh, uh, colors kindness right just be kind you're trying to tell the kids just just be kind it's all just about kindness who cares about your differences who cares about all these things just kindness just be kind Okay, I'll be honest, when I used to see that, I would just look at that, and I will just go, that is so fluffy. That is so empty. That is so shallow. No, we as people, we want discernment. We want to know what's right and what's wrong. We want to know what's good and what's bad, what's good and what's better. We want to know, and, and, and so we can, we can be people of righteousness. Oh, just kindness, just kindness. I'm like, that's so fluffy. Oh, but as I study this passage, the more and more I'm like, oh, kindness. Oh, for us Christians, that's our thing. Oh, we should be people. This is our thing when it comes to kindness. See, my confusion when I used to laugh at the use of kindness is that I, I was confused about what kindness is. And, and here it is. Kindness is not niceness. When we're dealing with what kindness is, when it says love is kind, kindness here in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, this is not about being nice. Kindness to someone is not just about niceness, being nice and smiling and, and, you know, know, just to someone. It's not niceness. Niceness is a front we put on outside, smiling, you know, polite. Kindness is is a front we put on on the outside. Kindness... Here, in verse 4, kindness is something the Holy Spirit produces in us, in our hearts. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit in us, and at work in us, the fruit of the Spirit in us is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Kindness, this kind of kindness, is something God does in us. It's not just a front that we put on our face. It's something God supernaturally produces in our hearts and our lives. This kind of kindness. Kindness is not just about being nice. Kindness, and here's uh, uh, my best shot at a summary description of what kindness is. Kindness is treating someone better than he deserves. 
Okay, patience is not repayment of evil. When someone has done evil to you, you don't repay evil. You extend patience. Kindness is not only waiting. Kindness is extending good things to one who does not deserve it. Oh, they did this to me. I got to repay them with this. Oh, they did this to me. I repay with this. No. Kindness is they did this to me. I'm going to repay them with this. Re- Kindness is treating someone better than he deserves. They don't deserve this. But I'm called to be kind. Love is kindness. Treating someone better than they deserve. For example, there's this well-known pastor and preacher. Uh, People would, would ask him, hey, how are you doing? How are you doing today? And his response wouldn't be, oh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing good. He would always respond when someone says, how are you doing? He would respond, better than I deserve. How are you doing today? Better than I deserve. Even if he was having a bad day, so how are you doing? Better than I deserve. Having a really good day? Oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing far better than I deserve. Why? Because he knows, oh, before this good and great and righteous God, he deserves wrath. He deserves judgment for the life that he lived. He knows, oh, the way that I lived this morning, I deserve wrath of God. For the way that I, 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 my heart and my, 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 my life this morning, I deserve judgment for my sins. I deserve so much. Oh, but God is so kind to me that he has given me far better than I deserve in my life. This is kindness. This is about the kindness of God. This is about the kindness that should show in our lives. Again, kindness and patience are, are two sides. Patience is slow to anger to someone. Kindness is show, extending good things, uh, extending compassion, extending grace to that one. For us as Christians, patience is not enough. Patience, as, as much as it is, is not enough. Kindness is also needed. 2 Timothy 2.24, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. To everyone. This is how we treat them, better than they deserve. Kindness to everyone. Colossians 3.12, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. This is something we put on. This is the way that we walk into the world. This is the way that when we wake up in the morning, we put on this before we go out into the world, before we go to work, before we get in that car. We're called to be people of kindness. 2 Corinthians 6 says this, But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness. Notice we need to be people of patience and people of kindness. Oh, they deserve this. They did this to me, they deserve this. No, we treat them better than they deserve. This is the way Christians were in the, in the early church when uh, there were great persecutions, great tribulations in the world. Uh, even though the world didn't truly understand this new uh, uh, group, uh, Christians, They didn't understand what they believed. They didn't understand their religion. They thought they were weird. They were this new group. But what they couldn't deny was that these people were people of great kindness. Listen to what this one scholar said about those Christians back in the early church. The kindness of Christians in the second century, the early church, so surprised their pagan counterparts that according to one historian, they called Christians... They called Christians uh, people of kindness. People of kindness. It was, uh, it was their kindness that surprised them. It was their kindness that was so evident in them. When they saw this group, they were like, these people are kind. We don't understand what they believe. We don't know what they're about. We don't understand this gospel thing or this crucifixion thing. We don't really know much about them, but we can't deny that when we see them, we see this about them. Oh, they were filled with kindness. They treated all people with kindness. 
So that's the first part of this, uh, this, this passage about love. Love is patient. Oh, big heartedness. Not easily angered. No matter what comes, I'm slow to anger. But also this, kindness. Oh, the one who offended me, not only do I not lash out at them, I extend compassion to them better than they deserve. But I want us to go on. Notice the next pairing. It says, love does not envy or boast. Oh, this, this part really convicted me because this is, a, this is a pairing about love that I don't know about you, but I can relate to. And I believe there is much here for us to see as a microscope to our hearts. Notice again, it says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. The word envy. When you hear the word envy, what do you think about? Envy, a very basic description, is to want what belongs to someone else. This is what I have. That person, I see. This is what they have. Oh, I see what they have. They have it, I don't, and I feel this thing in my heart of resentment, even of hatefulness. Why, why does he have that and I don't? I feel that thing in my heart. That's envy. It could be a possession. It could be a person. It could be a position in, in a community, at work. It could be fortune. It could be success. Oh, you eye that person. You see. You're like, why does that person have that and I don't? And I feel envy in my heart. I not only want what he has, but I resent. I resent it that he has it and I don't. Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever had envy in your heart before? The way you see someone else and you feel it in your heart. Listen to what this famous author said. Very famous author. This person has a lot of success himself. But listen to what this famous author said. Whenever a friend, another uh, famous author friend, succeeds... Whenever a friend succeeds, a little something in me dies. Oh, I see the way that that person succeeded. I see the kind of applause that person's getting. I see the kind of recognition and attention that person's getting. And I see it, and a little something in me dies. Listen to what this famous actor said. This is uh, an actor who... uh, attended another actor's performance and this actor said after his great performance the louder they cheered him the more I wept for myself this is a very famous actor he's been cheered too oh but the louder they cheered for him the louder that cheer got for him the more I wept in my heart this is envy This is envy, and this is something that, um, I don't know, I I think this is so common. This is is something that is, uh, that we see from the very beginning of Scripture, right, with Cain and Abel. This is something we see throughout Scripture, uh, Saul and David. Uh, This is something we see all over the place and in our lives. Listen to what this author said about envy. Envy makes you feel resentment or anger or sadness, Because another person has something or another person is something that you want that for yourself. They have it, I don't. Oh, my heart. The author goes on to say, with envy, this thing, envy, you experience sorrow in another person's joy and joy in another person's sorrow. Oh, they're doing well. I'm sorrowful. Oh, they're not doing well. Oh, I feel pretty good. I feel bad for saying that, but in my heart, when I see them fall, I feel a little bit better about myself. But when I see them rise, oh, I feel very envy in my heart, a lot of envy in my heart. What do we do with this? We don't want to admit that we ever feel envy, 
But uh, a lot of times, it's so natural to man. Well, about this envy, the Bible says much of. And I can't get into all of it, but I'll just mention a few things here quickly. First, an envious heart is a mark of worldliness. An envious heart is a mark of being worldly in our hearts, in our attitudes. It's a mark of fleshliness, worldliness. 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, For you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy, envy, and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving in only a human way? Human way. Not a spiritual way, a, f- a human fleshly way. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church where people were, were fighting for, uh, for, for greatness in a church and uh, a lot of envy was in the church. And Paul said, are you not just merely behaving in a human fleshly way? This is so worldly. Galatians 5.19, now the works of the flesh... The flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, going on, envy. And it says, I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is about the serious sin of having envy in our hearts. James 3, 14, but if you have bitter jealousy, the NIV mentions envy, if you have envy and selfish ambition in your heart, this is not the wisdom that comes from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. See, having envy in our hearts is a mark of worldliness for ourselves. But also, envy An envious heart is something that we must kill, ASAP, as soon as possible. If we have envy in our hearts, we need to kill that thing right away. We need to to remove all envy from our hearts. 1 Peter 2, 1, so put away, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Notice, envy is not something that is natural to us, that we just say, okay, well, that's just the way it is. That's all right. That's not that bad. No, the Bible says, put it away. Get rid of it, ASAP. Galatians 5.20 says, 6, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This is something that we are called to not be. Oh, we are not to have envy in our hearts. Get rid of it from our lives. Do not have any envy in our hearts. The question is, is how? How do we remove envy from our hearts and our lives? Well, there's only one way. Let me give us an example. I was once watching a play. It was a play, and uh, there were a lot of uh, performers up there, but there was one performer in that play that was just so much better than everyone else. But the thing is, that person was a little smaller. His physical appearance looked a little bit less impressive. So this person was given a lesser role. And the main actors and actresses in that, in, that, uh, in that play just weren't as good as this guy was. This guy was just better. Every scene this guy was in, he just stood out because his acting was so much better than everyone else. And you could see it right away. This was the best actor on the stage, but he was not given a, a very good role. Others, less uh, uh, great actors, were given better roles. There came a time in the play where uh, people applauded uh, the the, the actors and actresses. And uh, uh, one of the main actresses uh, was put forward and everyone applauded. Guess who was the one who was applauding the loudest? Oh, you saw that guy in the back. Standing in the back where he was, just with a big joy. And the louder the claps got, the more he clapped with, with a greater smile. Oh, because he was... He was finding joy in another person's success. Oh, it's possible to, when there is someone who is is finding success, oh, you find joy in it. Oh, that is so great that that there is success being found. Oh, that is so great that this person's hard work is paying off. Oh, it is so great. And, And this person was clapping loud because there was applause happening for someone else. Romans 12, 15, rejoice 
with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. When there is rejoicing happening for someone else, you rejoice with them. When there is weeping, you weep with them. For us, we must learn how to find real joy when others succeed. We must find real joy. Oh, look at how they're using their gifts. Oh, look at how they're being recognized for their work. Oh, look at how that person has that, uh, has, has that recognition. And we find joy when, there's, when others succeed. We're thankful when we succeed, and we find joy when others succeed. That is part of love, to not envy. That is what it means to be loving people. And of course, this is only possible when we deeply trust our good Father who has allowed it all. Whatever he has, whatever I have, whatever I don't have, I deeply trust my Father who allowed all of it. Oh, God has given me this. I'm so thankful. God has not given me this. Oh, I know my God is good, and I trust him. Whatever I have, whatever I do not have, my Father allowed it. Whatever he has, whatever he does not have, my father allowed it, and I trust him deeply. Not one good thing does my father ever withhold from me. Not one hair do I lack that my God, my good father, has not allowed it. That's envy. Now we are running very short on time, so I'll just wrap this up quickly. The other side of envy is boasting. Notice in verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. Does not envy, but that's not enough. We also don't boast. Now, quickly, what is boasting? I read somewhere that it said boasting is to become conceited, to be conceited, to be puffed up. But perhaps the best description of what boasting is, is love does not brag. Love does not brag. And I read one, a very well-known commentary writer, he said, this translation is just right. This is just right, bragging. That is what boasting is, to brag. Listen to what uh, Tom Schreiner said. The word used here for boasting points to bragging, where people go on and on and on about their accomplishments and their gifts and abilities, bragging about themselves. Listen to what uh, John MacArthur said. It is ironic that as much as most of us dislike bragging in others, we are so inclined to brag ourselves. When someone else shows up and starts bragging about themselves, we're just like, oh, oh, that is, that is so unpleasant. When others brag, but we ourselves love to brag about ourselves. There is this natural tendency, inclination in our hearts, this thing called bragging or boasting. Now, bragging is not an innocent thing. Bragging is not just a bad personality trait or a bad habit. Bragging is a very evil sin in the eyes of God. Proverbs 6, verse 16, there are six things that the Lord, what, hates. Seven things, uh, seven that are an abomination to him. First and foremost, haughty eyes. This boastful attitude in the way that we look at the world. This is something that God hates. We may find it unpleasant. Well, God hates it. The question is why? Why is bragging or boasting such a serious evil sin? In the context of the first of the Corinthian church, the Corinthian church were a very proud church. They were a church filled with church members who loved to brag about themselves. They were not a humble, sacrificial church. They were a church that competed with each other. They were a church that loved to brag when they felt better than another. This was a a church that, that loved to boast. This was a church that loved to brag. And now Paul is confronting them, saying love does not brag. Love does not boast. And the reason why boasting or bragging is such an evil sin, unpleasant to us, but evil sin in the eyes of God, is for this church, the more they bragged about who they were, the less they what? They praise God for who he is. Let me say it one more time. The more they bragged about themselves, the more they praised God for the great God that he is. If something good happens, if there is a great gift being used, 
if there is success had, oh, praise God. Praise God. No, they bragged about themselves. That's robbing God of praise. When you brag about yourself, you are robbing God of the praise that he deserves. This is about the God who is over all. This is about the God who every good and perfect gift comes from him. And when they bragged, they didn't praise. And that's robbing God of glory. Bragging, boasting for us is a very evil sin. And it's something that we must never become a church full of, become Christians that have it. Instead, may we be a church that loves to praise God and give glory to God for who he is and what he has done. All right. That's the first part of this passage about uh, love. May God cause his word to, to shape our lives and grow us in Christ-like love because this is who Christ is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time in your word. We thank you for the truth of your word, and your word truly is a mirror to our lives. So we pray that as we study your words and as we go forth from this room and meditate and seek to use your word in our lives and, and be people of your word, not just hearers but doers, Father, may we grow in love. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.